See, we all have a worldview. And if you ever have a professor who says to you, I base my life on proof, boy, you better go after the dude. And you better go ask him, oh, really? Tell me, professor, what are you living for? And secondly, what's the evidence that what you're living for is true? The proof. And you're going to watch him or her stumble all over her words. One of the clearest revelations of God's love. Hosea is married to a woman named Gomer. She plays the prostitute. He's holding what he thinks is his baby in his arms from his wife. And suddenly he realizes, I'm not this baby's daddy. My wife's been playing the prostitute. And God is teaching Hosea a lesson. God is saying, Hosea, do you know the pain that you're experiencing over your wife's sexual unfaithfulness? Well, that is similar to the pain that I feel because human beings who I created to love me and live in a relationship with me have turned their backs on me and gone their own way. Tremendous depiction of the love of God. Where's the bloodiest book in the Bible? It's not in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Book of Revelation. It talks about how the blood will flow when Christ returns a second time, a battle of Armageddon. Evil is punished and destroyed. So I think the Bible is very, very consistent that God is good. His goodness is revealed in his justice, which means he abhors evil and punishes evil. But he delights in forgiving people, and that's what the cross of Christ is all about. At the cross of Christ, you've got the justice of God and the mercy of God coming together. God is too just to allow evil to win, to allow evil to go unpunished. God is too merciful to simply allow people who've done evil to go to hell. So he sends his son Christ to bleed and die on a cross to absorb the just penalty for human evil, thereby offering them forgiveness. That's what the gospel is all about. That's the first question. The second question is, what about interpretation? I hope you interpret the Bible the same way you are taught at this fine university to interpret any document. You read in context. You don't rip one line out of Othello and say, this is Shakespeare's worldview. You read in context. Secondly, you respect literary style. If it's a science textbook, you read it as science. If it's historical narrative, you read it as history. And if it's a poem by John Donne or Robert Blake, you don't read it as science and you don't read it as history. You read it as poetry. <coughs> now, you will find no science anywhere in the Bible. You will find history. You will find speakers and authors using parable, metaphor, simile. And you will also find an incredibly symbolic type of literature called apocalyptic literature in Ezekiel, Daniel, and the book of Revelation. So, I read everything literally, which means I read a poem literally as a poem. And if I read it as a science textbook, that's intellectually dishonest. And I read historical narrative as historical narrative. And I read science textbook as science scientific language. And I better learn to distinguish between different literary styles. And by the way, the Iliad and the Odyssey are epic poems. And if I don't know and learn how to interpret epic poetry, I'm going to mess up with the Iliad and the Odyssey. So we've got to learn to respect literary style, and then we interpret. Now, finally, I like what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that disturb me. And there are parts of the Bible that are very difficult to interpret. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand that disturb me. On the basics, the Bible is all too clear. Are there many difficult passages? Yes. It takes a lot of study to think them through. Okay, how have I not answered you? Those are two great questions. Mm, what, what would be an example of something to take literally and something not to? You bet. Jesus was born of a virgin. It's communicated in the literary style of historical narrative. It's to be taken literally. Jesus as an historical fact. Jesus says, I am the door. To interpret that literally does not mean he's claiming to be two pieces of plywood slapped together. Right? You've got to allow a speaker to use allegory, simile, metaphor. Jesus says, go tell that fox, King Herod. Not meaning by that that Herod has a bushy tail and brown fur. In the Old Testament, we read about the Jews going into the land of Palestine, a land flowing with milk and honey. It does not mean that their sandals were getting stuck to the ground because of all the honey. Well, I mean, those are obvious ones, but... Yes. What about more like one man, one woman, 
at the beginning of the world. Good. Gets more difficult. Good Those point. Those are... That's a lot... That's a lot more straightforward. Good. You're right. Things Those... will get more difficult. <coughs> now, Genesis chapter 1. Take your NIV, your international version, and you will notice indentations. The type of indentation that suggests this is not historical narrative. This is poetry. Eight four-line Hebrew poems, Genesis chapter 1. One of your professors here might say, oh, no, 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 clips are wrong. It's not poetry. All right, fine. Then I want you to do the following. I want you to look at the parallelism in, in Genesis chapter 1. Six days of creation, right? First day... Shoot, man. <laughs> I hope it's not advancing Alzheimer's. <laughs> what I want you to notice is the parallelism between day one and day four, day two and day five, day three and day six. All right? There's a parallelism there that's fascinating. And I would argue that's clearly a sign of Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry was not necessarily rhyming. It was often parallelism. All right, first day, God says, let there be light. Guess what he creates on the fourth day? Sun. Okay? Second day, what does God create? Let, the, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And God called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Guess what he creates the fifth day? Birds and fish, sky and water, where they live. What does he create the third day? Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees. What does he create the sixth day? animals and humans. So there's a clear parallelism between day one and day four, day two and day five, day three and day six. So you've got what I'm convinced is, and the NIV tips us off to that by the indentation, and then you've got the parallelism between those different days, and obviously this is not a science textbook. And I would argue, obviously it's not historical narrative. He's communicating truth, but he's communicating it in a type of poetical form. Therefore, if I go to Genesis chapter 1 looking for a scientific answer to the question, what process did God use to create? There is none there. Which means it's intellectually dishonest for me to say science contradicts Genesis chapter 1 because there's no science in Genesis chapter 1 to contradict. It's Hebrew poetry. Well, Cliff, you've got to realize the reason I'm an atheist is because of science. What do you mean, because of science? Don't you realize that modern science began with Christians who understood God is created in an orderly way, he's given me a rational mind, and by doing good science rationally, I can unlock the secrets of how God created. And that's why Johann Kepler, the father of modern astronomy, as he peered out into the stars at night, exclaimed, Oh God, I am thinking your thoughts after you. And that's why yesterday we had Dr. Gaskell out here, an astronomy professor at this fine university, PhD in astronomy, who stands here and says, I'm a deeply committed follower of Jesus Christ, and I have a PhD in astronomy. And there's absolutely no contradiction between the two. And he's an expert in black holes. I don't know the first thing about black holes. The guy's a genius. He's a PhD in this area, okay? And there's absolutely no contradiction between his faith in Christ, the Bible, and studying black holes and being an incredible professor of astronomy. Does that make sense? So I would encourage you to tell your friend, this is not a bunch of fairy tales, but it's also not a science textbook. And there's history here, but there's also poetry and highly symbolic literature. So study it and be honest. See, like, the Vedas and Upanishads of Hinduism, it's mythology. Now, if I say to you, if you ask me, Cliff, why are you not Hindu? 
Why don't you accept the Vedas and Upanishads? If I say because it's mythology, I'm an idiot. Why? Because you can communicate truth through mythology, and that's the claim of the Vedas and Upanishads. And if I just blow them away because it's mythology, I'm an idiot. It's legitimate to communicate truth through mythology. So I've got to dig deeper and understand, okay, does the evidence support the avatars of Hinduism and the whole Hindu worldview, or does it not? And for me to reject Hinduism because it's claiming to communicate truth through myth, I'm a narrow-minded bigot. You can communicate truth through mythology. So you gotta, you know, you gotta think, you gotta, you gotta work it through. Does that make any sense? Makes good sense. Thank you, sir, for raising the issue. Uh, well, to prove your religion correct, in a sense, yes. wouldn't you have to prove others wrong? Okay. You can't prove it. All right? Well, you can't prove God exists. I could never prove God exists. The question is not proof. The question is, what's most reasonable to believe in light of the evidence? See, we all have a worldview. And if you ever have a professor who says to you, I base my life on proof, boy, you better go after the dude. And you better go ask him, oh, really? Tell me, professor, what are you living for? And secondly, what's the evidence that what you're living for is true? The proof. And you're going to watch him or her stumble all over her words. Everybody has a worldview. Every atheist, every agnostic, every Hindu, Buddhist, Jew, Muslim, Christian. None of us can prove that our worldview is correct. The materialist says, you want to know what the bottom line principle is? Matter, material. Now, it's very logical if you're a materialist to live for money. You don't have to, but it's very logical, right? Because reality, bottom line principle is matter. So live for money and live for expensive toys and gadgets. What's the pantheist say? The pantheist says, nature is God. You're God. So therefore, meditate and get in touch with the deity that you are and the deity in the tree. That's faith. That's a worldview. <coughs> what does the empiricist say? The empiricist says, I have faith that the bottom line principle, that ultimate reality is what I can see, smell, taste, hear, and touch. Well, you can't prove that, my empiricist friend. That's your worldview. That's your faith. And obviously, the biological Darwinist has profound faith that biology is the bottom line. And that be it your religion, be it your ethics, be it your love or whatever, it all has a biological root. Okay, I'm a follower of Christ. I believe there's a God who created all of this. That is my worldview. And it informs me why I have my rational mind, because it's a gift from a rational creator. It informs me why life exists, because life comes from life, not from non-life. It informs me that the moral absolutes that I am convinced are real, like if someone picks up a gun and shoots you because you're of a different race, that's absolutely evil, because it's a violation of your worth as a person. It's a violation of the value of justice. I am convinced that faith in Christ makes the most sense of life as we experience it. But everybody has faith, and so the question is, what's the evidence that your faith is right, is true? But I'm really obviously frustrated with people who say, oh, you religious people, you have faith. The rest of us, we really use logic, and we really think. Uh, excuse me, you pompous rascal. I can promise you, there are many devout Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians who really think. The question is, why do you embrace the worldview you do? Because none of us can prove that our worldview is true. You can't prove it. The question is, does the evidence point to your worldview being true? And obviously, the woman who was speaking before you, did you see how I was trying to push her and ask her, can you really live out your atheism? And I think I almost had her to the point of realizing I can't live it out. Because when I was really hurt by that person, I don't, obviously don't know how she was hurt, but when she was being hurt by that warped person, she wasn't lapsing back into a relativism saying, you know, maybe this is okay. May, I, from my pr perspective, it's wrong, but from his perspective, it's all right. So, you know, it's maybe okay. No. She was holding to, this is really, really wrong. 
That's not the position of a relativist. The position of a relativist is nothing's really wrong. It's subjectively wrong, and my opinion is it's wrong, but your opinion is right, and I'm not right and you're not wrong. It's all relative. So you can't live that out. So if you can't live out your worldview, you better go back and be really skeptical about whether your worldview is correct. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. One final point. I'm not a Hindu because I can't accept monism, which is the belief that everything is God, as being true to my life and my observation. Here's why. If monism is right, everything is part of God, I walk up to her, haul back and slap her. What just happened? You slapped yourself. Part of God just hit part of God. <laughs> Which means you wipe out the basis of understanding justice. Gandhi got his understanding that the caste system was wrong, not from the Vedas and Upanishads. He got it from the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is based on a worldview that she's not part of God, I'm not part of God. God is a separate being who gave her value and worth and who created a value of justice and gave me a conscience that I can understand that value of justice. And when I hold back and slap her, that is evil because I am violating a human being given worth by God. Now that's life as I experience it. If he is just someone that makes the most sense right now, uh, couldn't something happen or couldn't someone else come and make even more sense? I live in a culture that teaches me all religions are equally valid. Okay. That's impossible for me to accept because of the law of non-contradiction. A and not A cannot both be true in the same way at the same time. People say to me, Cliff, you've got to understand all religions are the same on the core issues. In the superficial issues, they contradict each other. False. Study the different world religions, and you'll find out that on the core issues they contradict, on the superficial issues they agree. Then the person comes on a little stronger in my culture, and they say to me, Cliff, you have got to realize that your belief in Jesus Christ is intolerant, narrow-minded. What you have to realize is your belief that Jesus is true leads to a threat to international peace, it leads to war, it leads to discrimination. So by this time, I'm going to begin to ask myself, okay, so what are you really saying? What you're really saying to me is, all religions are equally valid, which means either there is no God, or there is a God who's impersonal, who does not care what you think about him, her, it, they, whatever God is. And it begins to sound to me like you're a Western Enlightenment thinker who's convinced that there really probably isn't a God and that religion is just a creation of the human mind, which is why you're saying that all religions are equally valid, or else you believe that God is an impersonal force and it really doesn't matter what you think about God. And what you've got to realize is that's your worldview that's your faith. And it's very Western, it's very enlightenment in its definition of values and knowledge. And I think you're going to hear that on this campus. So I'm going over it with you. All right? Okay. And what I hope you see is that that is a worldview, that is a faith. It cannot be proven, but it's what certain people hold to tenaciously. My comeback to that as a follower of Christ is, I can promise you, if you think the one who, as he was bleeding and dying on a cross, prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you think for me to follow that one is going to make me intolerant, think again. Adam and Eve were, were not born as infants. There was no human birth canal for them to pass down. So they were, they were born as adults. Sorry, I just wanted to get that cleared up in the Bible. Well, I'm um, glad we cleared it fast. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's, let, let's go back to this logic before we get too far off track. So God is confined by these sort of logical, logical realities. He's not confined. It's part of who he is. It's part of who he is. Yeah. I don't think you're confined 
by the very good mind that you have. I think you're exercising your mind in a very exciting way. You're yeah. thinking, and right. you're thinking well, and I like that, and I don't view that as a limit. I do think that if you start going blah, 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 that would be sad. Okay. All right, so then is there an omnipotence in God to do whatever he wants? There is omnipotence to do whatever is consistent with his character. But that's not omnipotence. That's Correct. That is not omnipotence as you would define it. Correct. No, that's not omnipotence how anyone would define it, I don't think. That's not true. I am defining omnipotence when it comes to the biblical revelation of God as God has power over his creation and he always exercises his power in conformity with his character. All right, so what is the definition of omnipotence then? I just gave it to you. God is all-powerful in the sense no, that he is all-powerful over the cre his creation and he, he exercises that power in conformity with his character, his nature. I'm not talking about in reference to God. I'm, I'm saying that if, if we're talking about written language, as of course the Bible was written in, and you were to define omnipotence as it would apply to any time we would use it, how would you define the omnipotence? The Bible never uses the word omnipotence. Well, I mean, it was not written in English, but it was translated. The Bible never uses the word omnipotent in Greek or Hebrew, which is the original languages the Bible was written in. All right, well, do you believe that God is omnipotent? In the way I described, yes, not in the way you described. Okay, so, so God cannot do anything. Correct. God cannot do anything. That's absolutely correct. All right, just clearing that up. All right. Also, then, is God omniscient? In other words, does he know everything? God, because he is outside of time, sees all of history at a glance. So God sees pre past, present, and future at a glance. Simultaneously. At the same time, correct. All right. So um, g given that God right, is an eternal being, and, or essentially atemporal, right? and he has no, no concept of this temporality, right? Namely, if we were eternal beings, and say, uh, we can make an example of it. Um, for instance, let, let's call time, temporality, a dot, right? And God exists above the dot, right? God is eternal. Mm -hmm. He's a line, a line segment that goes on forever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, given that we're temporal, like you're saying, and he's atemporal, what kind of concept does he have of time? And if he makes an action, can it be temporal? In other words, if I do something wrong today, how does God know that I did it wrong today and not tomorrow, given the fact that he has no concept of temporality because he's eternal? Well, I can promise you God is more than intelligent enough to understand time. He began it in the be Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God's creating time. Not only that, God stepped into time by becoming a human being in Jesus of Nazareth. Sure. So God is more than capable of understanding time, and not only understanding time, but stepping into time, and that's the mystery of the incarnation, of Jesus as God becoming a human being. All right, so, I mean, this is talked about, um, especially by a lot of uh, um, abstract physicists, as E.T. simultaneity and basically talking about how um, in, the, in the concept of eternality, right, anything that happened temporarily would be simultaneous with another event that happened temporally because they've already happened, right? In other words, since everything has already happened, this discussion has already happened, it is essentially simultaneous with every other discussion that's ever happened. I disagree. If there is no temp if there is no time, right? There's no temporal line for God, right? Everything has already happened. You just I mean no, that's what everything you, has not already happened. What does that mean? You just explained it earlier as God knows what happened in the past, what happened now, and what happens in the future, right? He has he everything has already happened to God. No, everything has not already happened. It's his perspective is outside of the dimension of time. So God sees everything at a glance because of his perspective. Not because everything's already happened. All right, so his perspective. So now let's let's go back to my line analogy. And let's say that our, our dot now is moving forward at the rate of time, okay? And God sort of has this knowledge of time. We can say that he is a pen and drawing a line behind him such that he knows everything that's happened in the past and he knows everything that has happened up to this current point. In other words, he doesn't know the future or he could know the future, but he hasn't experienced the future? I'm trying to understand exactly what you're saying. All right, well, I don't understand exactly what I'm saying. Why? Because I'm <laughs> locked into time. 
I think in terms of five minutes ago, now, and five minutes from now. So for me to totally be able to understand and explain what it means that God is outside of time is impossible. I, I can't explain that totally because I'm so locked into time. But and an, a, a parallel line of thought that helps me is God is omnipresent, which means God can be in Calcutta, India, London, England, and Austin, Texas at the same time. Why? Because God is outside of the dimension of space. Okay. So because he's not confined by space, he can be in 25 different places at the same time. He's a spiritual being. Similarly, he's outside of the dimension of time, so he sees all of time at a glance. So he's outside the dimension of time. And space. Therefore, he doesn't experience time. No, I, we went over that. He can experience time if he chooses to step into time. That's the incarnation. Jesus is God stepping into time. There's no stream of events. Everything has already happened. He knows everything that's going to happen, and he knows everything that has happened. Therefore, there's no differentiation between what's happening now and what's going to happen five minutes from now. Do you understand that? Everything has not already happened. It has for God because he's not a temporal being, right? There's nothing in front of God temporally, right? Therefore, That's right, fine, but you're talking about his perspective. Right. His perspective is outside of time, so he sees everything. No, but we've agreed that he's not experienced, he's not part of time right now, right? We're not just talking about his perspective right now, we're also talking about his experience, right? Right to God. There's nothing in front of him because there's no temporality. There's nothing behind him. There is simply right at the moment, but there is no moment because he's atemporal, right? Everything has already happened and it's been consumed into one single point. There's no forward, there's no about to happen, there's no has happened, there's no happening. It's simply all there, right? There's no differentiation between time. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. Okay, all right. I disagree with you. So, do you disagree with me so yeah. you understand what I'm saying? Well, I think I understand what you're saying. I understand a part of what you're saying, and a part of that I understand I disagree with, but I think there's other parts of what you're saying that I don't understand. Okay. Does it make sense to you that if you're atemporal or eternal, there's nothing in front of you and there's nothing behind you, right? Everything, there's nothing happening right now. It's simply all there. There's no temporality. There's no differentiation between what's about to happen and what just did happen because there is no just did happen and there is no about to happen. Yeah, but God created history. He created time. When? When? Yeah. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us the age right. of the universe. Well, the, well, I think the, well, the, the, he created so the universe the, probably about 15 billion years ago. That's that's the point, though, right? There, there was no point in time when God created the world because he's atemporal. No, that's not true. See, there's an example of where we strongly disagree. God, who is outside of time, can create a universe that has a beginning. 